are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Michael Lesher, a writer, journalist, and attorney. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Ed. Michael, do you prefer Mike or Michael or Mr. Lesher? Michael is good. Michael? Michael is fine. Okay, yes. great. Michael, I saw an article in the New York Post recently, Breaking the Silence. The Brooklyn DA arrested an astounding 89 Orthodox men on charges of child sex abuse, forcing open a community that sometimes covers up such crimes. And this article is written by you. Now, I want to get into that in a couple of minutes, but before we do, for the benefit of the listeners, tell them who is Michael Lesher and why did you write this article? Well, I'm a writer, first and foremost. I'm also a lawyer, and although this column doesn't specifically mention it, I am an Orthodox Jew. I wasn't born or raised Orthodox, but returned to traditional Judaism as an adult. And so this has put me very much at the crosshairs of this issue. It would be very difficult for me to be both a member of the community and functioning as a lawyer and not be a little bit concerned about how Jewish children are treated or not properly treated within the legal system. And so for some years now, actually going back to 1997, I've had a lot to do with trying to see that that system works properly and unfortunately frequently uncovering the fact that it hasn't been working properly, that the intersection of the Orthodox community with the secular justice system has been in many ways an unfortunate one in which pressure has been placed on the system not to pursue cases of child sex abuse within the Orthodox community. Did you have any personal experience with this? Not with me personally, but with plenty of people who have come to me, plenty of clients that I've worked with. As far back as 1998, I got deeply involved in the case of Rabbi Avraham Mondrowitz, which I think we discussed before. Can you give a little overview of Mondrowitz? Because the listeners will be interested in hearing this. Yeah. That was a particularly horrendous case. It may be New York's worst case of serial child molestation on record. I'm not positive about that, but it could be. Mm-hmm. Police believe that he may have abused as many as hundreds of children, nearly all Orthodox Jewish boys, during the time he was in Brooklyn in the 1980s. When the case finally did make it to the police, which was late in 1984, he fled the country and ended up in Israel. He was indicted in 1985 on a very small portion of the cases the police believe he was actually responsible for. Mm -hmm. But it was still 13 counts of the highest levels of child sex abuse and sodomy. And he remains in Israel to this day. He's a free man. My research into the case, which I undertook because what little I knew about it was so outrageous, uncovered the fact, really for the first time, that the Brooklyn District Attorney, as of 1993, had specifically decided and informed the Justice Department that it did not want the case pursued. It was not going to make any effort to have Avram Andrewitz return for trial in Brooklyn as long as he remained in Israel. That decision was ultimately reversed as a result of public pressure, which I believe I had an important role in helping to stir Mm -hmm. in 2007. They did renew their extradition request. The Israeli government did, in fact, order his extradition, but ultimately, when it went before the Israeli Supreme Court, Mondrowitz prevailed for reasons that make no sense from a legal point of view, but a good deal of sense politically. And so he remains a free man now in Israel. That was my introduction into this story, or part of it, my introduction, I really should say. There were other people coming to me around the same time with similar stories. But the themes were extremely disturbing and disturbingly similar. The themes involved, first of all, the fact that many authorities, rabbis and others in the community, strongly discouraged victims of child sex abuse from reporting perpetrators, if they belong to the community also, to the secular authorities. The second theme was that in cases where it was reported, there was a good deal of behind-the-scenes pressure, as in the Mondrowitz case, and in other cases I've studied since, to, if possible, derail the process, either by applying political pressure directly on the people involved or by flooding them with purported evidence, which often turns out to be false evidence, that the accused person is innocent, and in general, trying to find ways to deflect the case, and unfortunately with considerable success, which is why when the Brooklyn District Attorney recently announced that over the last two years, his office has actually arrested and charged 89 people in that community with child sex abuse. It was news, news that provoked some natural skepticism, I think, but also, I hope, a lot of attention. The Brooklyn DA is Charles Hines. He's been in there for a while, hasn't he? Indeed he has. 
since, I believe, 1990. So when that decision was made in September of 1993 to pull the plug on the Mondrowitz case, that was the office of Charles Hines that did it. He was the one in charge. He had been elected just a few years earlier, very prominent support from the Orthodox community in Brooklyn. And in fact, after being elected, he had established a Jewish advisory council made up in almost entirely of Orthodox Jews to advise him on matters of interest to the community. And it's at this point, it's certainly no secret that they had their opinions as to whether cases like the Mondrowitz case should be pursued. And the position they held was that it shouldn't be. There is no official Jewish advisory council in Brooklyn today, I should say. Mm -hmm. But there was for some time. And there's no question about the close relationship that Charles Hines had, and to some extent still has, with the Orthodox community. But it's been evolving. And it's evolving in ways that are somewhat complicated. A few years ago, he announced the formation of a new program by which he argued that he was cooperating with an institution in the community called Ohel Children's Home and Family Service Agency mm -hmm. to increase reporting. That was, I think, 2006. And immediately questions arose as to whether this cooperation was to increase reporting, to deflect reporting, or to give institutions within the community some degree of say or control over how those cases were processed once the charges were made. It remains unclear exactly how that program, which is called Cult Tedic, is actually working. Just as it remains unclear, because unfortunately the DA won't tell us, just how these new 89 cases are being pursued. Exactly what's being charged in each case, what's the status of each case, has it been resolved, has it been tried, has it been plea bargained, when did the case originate, and so on. And how about the names the of the case? Case, Exactly, that too they haven't released. I don't expect them to be releasing the names of the victims, mind you, but the names of the perpetrators really shouldn't be a secret. So far they have declined to give any of that information. So that's an important piece of background to the column, as I do say in the column, these are matters of legitimate concern. But I also went on to say that the mere fact that the announcement has been made is significant. At the very least, it means that nobody can look at this community and say, as people did say within my memory, let's say as recently as the 1980s, that these crimes just don't happen there. That may sound absolutely preposterous to many people who are listening, but that actually was claimed by some prominent figures in the community. I can remember when Rabbi Schmidman, who's now, I think, a fugitive from justice himself, he was the head, I don't know if the exact title was executive director, president, I mean, one of the Council of Jewish Organizations in Borough Park, and he said in an interview back in, oh dear me, it was either the late 80s or early 90s, mm -hmm. that he had never never heard of a case in the Orthodox community involving child sex abuse. I'm stressing that just to illustrate, as preposterous as it may sound, this was a position taken within the community not that long ago. Today, obviously, nobody is saying that. No one could say that. So that's the first piece of news that this kind of announcement means. But the second thing it means is that the district attorney has embarked on a course of relative transparency that it seems to me can only advance in one direction, and that's toward more transparency rather than less. Once you start saying, we've done this, right. then the next step has to be, okay, we're going to explain a little bit more about how we've done this. We can't go back backwards and say, no, we're not going to tell you anything. I think from here, the only direction in which we're likely to go is to find out a little bit more about how that process is actually working and what the details of it look like. And I think that's all for the good. Why do you think he's coming out now and saying that there's tripled, you said, from October 2009? Yeah, that's right. The first time he ever made such an announcement was 2009. And there, too, he was speaking of a two-year period, and the number he gave was 26. And there were doubters then. I joined that course. I remember being asked at the time and saying, well, I certainly would like to believe it. I hope it's true, but I can't figure out how we get to 26, and he's not telling us. Well, now, two years later, we've more than tripled that number, according to us. So this is a big claim. It's an audacious claim, which, unless it's pure fabrication, which seems a little hard to believe, does indicate, at the very least, a serious desire to seem to be acting aggressively on this issue, which again, is an important point. He's not saying it's not real. He's not saying it doesn't need attention. He's not saying he's doing nothing. This is all something of a change from the past. As to why he's doing it now, right. I can't be sure. I will say he's not a young man. I don't think he's going to run for another term. This will probably be his swan song. And I suspect he doesn't want to leave office after all these years under one specific cloud of having not only botched, but helped to cover up, cover up right, yeah. serious crimes against children in a specific Brooklyn community. That would be an awful way to leave. He not a good legacy. A exactly. And I think at this stage in his career, he's probably thinking about his legacy. And it's only fair to say he has a pretty significant record of accomplishment. I think he would not like to see the last chapter of his story read with a sentence. And, but of course, there were extensive revelations of abuse cover-ups that his office participated in in Brooklyn in the last years of his tenure. Right. I think at least he would like to try to reverse that story at the end of his final term. And maybe he will. So you think that's what's motivating this, not that there might be a lot more cases that really can't be covered up anymore. Could it be that too, you think? 
Well, it is true that the community is changing from within at the same time for the same reasons that I was talking about a moment ago. We've gone from a position of almost blank denial mm -hmm. within the official administration to a position in which they are, in fact, admitting, and now admitting quite publicly, that this problem does exist. Again, that may seem like a very small step forward to people outside such communities, but in fact it represents quite a sea change, at least in some respects, when the community leadership is actually prepared to say publicly, yes, child sex abuse does happen in our communities, and yes, you should do something about it. Now, right now, there is still something of a controversy swirling around the community as to whether or not the more right-wing, as it were, orthodox rabbis are encouraging people who know that a case of child sex or believe that a case of child sex abuse exists to go directly to secular authorities or first to consult with a rabbi, a question of great significance. Right. And the answer to that remains somewhat unclear. But certainly they are saying, and they are saying publicly now, that you should do something about it. And secular law enforcement can and should be involved. That was behind the Coltetic program that I mentioned a minute ago that now has rabbinic approval. Whether that really is the correct solution to the problem, whether it represents a step entirely in the right direction, these are very fair questions. But it does certainly acknowledge how much is changing from within. And I can certainly tell you from people who talk to me that today people who are witnesses, potential witnesses, in a sex abuse case are much more willing from the most insular and pious of the Orthodox communities to contact police than they would have been 30 years ago. I can tell you from victims of Mondrowitz that I've spoken to, and in one case from the mother of one of the victims who had subsequently killed himself, that, and this happened, remember, he fled the country in 1984, the end of 1984. It was really early in 1985 that there began to be more publicity within the community about the case because at that time police were actively investigating. I think it's fair to say almost everyone that I spoke to has expressed to me, of course they were young at the time, if they were the victims, they were children. They weren't all little children, some of them were teenagers, some of them were in their late teens, and as I said, one of them was a mother of the child, so she was an adult, but they all said that they didn't know that anybody else was in such a position. They didn't know that this had ever happened to anybody else. They thought their case was unique. So they were all much more vulnerable to, I don't even want to use the word the threats. I don't know that threats were made. It was more just a matter of advice in their cases, that it was better to keep the case quiet, that it was better to let the rabbis handle it internally, it was better for their children not to go forward to the grand jury. And in fact, as it turned out, not one Orthodox Jewish child did testify to the grand jury. When I mentioned the counts against Bondrewitz for which he was indicted, those arose entirely from non-Jewish neighbors of his that he also allegedly abused. But even though many of those children, the Jewish children, did go to police, and police knew of about, I think, about 70, and believed that there were far more. As I said, I think they believed that the number of victims ran into the hundreds. Mm -hmm. Not one went to the grand jury. Wow. So at that time, it was very easy to manage the problem in that way, because everybody who was being managed thought this was a one-off, that things like this just don't happen. Today, that would never happen. And one of the main reasons for that, by the way, I think, is the Internet. Whatever else it has done, one of the things it did in this case was to allow people to find out that they weren't the only victims, that there were actually not only lots of victims, but lots of different perpetrators. And some of those perpetrators were still in teaching positions after decades of allegedly abusing people. That's what happened when the case of Rabbi Coco made it into the newspapers. And that happened largely because of Internet contact between different people who said, oh, I was a victim of his 20 years ago. And someone else writing, yeah, yeah, I was a victim of his too. That was 25 years ago. So they didn't know, and they really didn't have any way of knowing until this medium came into existence, that there were these patterns, that these weren't just isolated incidents and they didn't involve just one or two people, that there were institutions involved and the institutions had made a business of protecting these people. That was a new discovery. Mm -hmm. It may sound naive to people, especially in light of all the extensive press coverage of the Catholic clergy abuse story, but these people didn't know until they were able to learn that other people had similar experiences and with whom and exactly how they worked, that the people were able to connect the dots and begin to recognize some aspects of the system that they had not really known the existence of before. Yeah, I don't think the Advanced Research Projects Agency at the Pentagon figured what the Internet would do when they put it together in 1969 and released it for commercial use in 1992. I don't think they could have imagined all the barriers that it would break down, all the doors that it would open. It also has a really unparalleled facility for allowing people scattered over a large area without knowing one another to find out certain common denominators, for good or ill. Right. 
but they certainly can find each other quite easily. When I wanted information on my cases, it was the easiest thing in the world. You could make a blog posting somewhere, a few places, and say, you know, if anybody knows anything about X, Y, or Z, let me know. And you just get the overwhelming responses from people all over the, you know, they can be anywhere. People right. from Israel, people from the United States. I would never have known even where to look for. Right. It is amazing. That was one of the things that the internet did do. And it's not surprising, therefore, in my opinion, that one of the things the Orthodox leadership has been particularly insistent on over the last 10 years or so is the evil of the internet. They don't give this as a reason, mind you. The reasons they do give are generally not very convincing. And in fact, one thing they did specifically say at a convention of Agudah Israel just a few years ago, that it does encourage maligning rabbinic leadership. And one can hardly read that in any way except the coded reference to precisely this kind of issue. And they should be open to criticism. They should be open to everything if they're real leaders, right? Well, yes, and that's my view, and not only mine. And in fact, I almost feel embarrassed having to say it, because to me it seems so self-evident. Not only that they should be open, and not, by the way, I don't by any means mean that all the criticism is fair, and certainly some of the things you can read on the internet may be not only unfair and factually inaccurate, but also very crudely expressed. I understand that. From time to time, people have written things about me, and I can tell you, it isn't always a nice thing to see. But the point really to be made is that this is, after all, a religious community. And if you're in a position of religious leadership, it seems just self-evident that your ultimate goal is not about your position of power or prestige, whatever else it is. That's something that a religious community never claims to be supporting, and in fact, never even claims to want to tolerate among its leadership. That they should be motivated by arrogance or cupidity. That's the very last thing they would agree that they're to be guided by. The main things they're supposed to be guided by are the interests and the welfare of their community. Not just that they're criticizing them, but the people are saying, listen, we have a serious problem here and something has to be done about it. The last thing in the world they should be doing from a religious point of view, is saying, let's find a way to silence the criticism. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, again, this seems perfectly self-evident, but it happens. Not that they're not doing anything else, but that has been a theme. Unfortunately, a lot of the, I don't want to say theology, but the religious culture that's involved here has become intensely hierarchical in its thinking. Just to reduce this to a sentence, I guess I would say, people have been led to believe that if we cannot idolize the rabbis, that we will have no religion to live for. We have to be able to look up to the people who hold these positions as if they were more than human. I don't think I need to stress what a disastrous idea that is in practice. I can say, though obviously I can't really prove in the space of an interview like this, that I think it's also very contrary to Jewish tradition. But I think the real problem is simply that it exists. But the rabbi is held in such high regard, though. And I can say, isn't he, right? Because there are very few, or are there any female rabbis? You touch on a very interesting and complicated question. In Orthodox tradition, there are not female rabbis, though it is now a matter of significant controversy as to whether that is the result of a religious rule or prohibition or simply a matter of history and tradition. And if the latter, whether it has to be followed. And this is a debate not just in non-Orthodox circles, it's a debate going on right now in parts of the Orthodox world. Remember, Orthodox Judaism is something of a spectrum. When you talk about Orthodox Jews, don't just picture the Yerdes Hasidim. There are also many people who look considerably different, as I do, for example, right. who look, talk, and think quite differently, though in many respects we're living the same religious life. And there's a lot of ferment throughout the community and a lot of disagreement about many points. And it was interesting to me that when this came up in a very dramatic way recently when a prominent Orthodox rabbi, I don't want to misstate exactly what happened, he either named a woman as a rabbi or endorsed the idea of naming a woman as a rabbi. I don't want to misrepresent it. I'm not sure exactly what he said, but the issue was raised. And I remember a spokesman at that time for the more right-wing Orthodox organization, Agudath Israel, made a public statement in which I thought the most interesting part of the statement was not only that he rejected the idea of female rabbis, but he said quite clearly that it was not decisive to a Agudah's position what Jewish law was. I thought that was extraordinary. Most people would assume that what determines your position as you move to the right in orthodoxy is your increasingly stringent application of Jewish law. That's an error. I don't know if that's true in other religions. I believe from what I read about people who know more about them that this is, in fact, the case in Christianity, and I believe in Islam today as well. What we think is a stricter application, or what they sometimes will say is a stricter application of religious law, actually turns out to be the opposite. And in this case, he was quite clear in his public statement. He said, we don't care basically what Jewish law is. We know what the tradition that we believe in would dictate, and we know what our rabbis say. So essentially what he was saying is that religious culture and politics trump religious law, which is not what you would think would be the position of the intensely orthodox rabbis. That's where we have moved to. That kind of attitude has many effects, and it has an effect on the child abuse issue as well. You have to wonder, or at least I was wondering, is this something that always existed? Is this something that 
again, going back to the internet, we're only hearing about more because of the internet. Is this something that humans have been doing to other humans since the beginning of time? What do you think? Because it seems like it's all over the place. I have three sons, and I can't imagine having that kind of a desire to do something to a child. Do you think this is something that has existed since the beginning of time? Well, here I can only speculate, but I'm willing to do that because I think it's important that we think about it. I think it's been with us a long time, and I think it's a more deeply rooted phenomenon in contemporary culture, and by no means just Jewish culture. We've been talking about Jewish Orthodox cases of child abuse because that's what it happens to be involved in, and that has triggered certain unusual legal issues because of the way the community has handled them. But I'm not suggesting in any way that this is a problem that is more extensive in that community than elsewhere, or certainly not unique to it. And we see in the Penn State story not only that we have such cases of abuse in a very different environment, but in some respects, the same kinds of cover-up mechanisms seem to have been in place, the same unwillingness to believe that this respected authority figure who, to make things worse, was connected with the football team, which is, of course, an extremely respected. I'm not a football fan. This is all a bit alien to me, but apparently this is an enormously respected institution there. So you just couldn't take the word of a child that he was being sexually abused. But to stick to your question, yeah, I think this is a more deeply rooted problem in our society than most of us have really wanted to acknowledge. Mind you, when I say that, I don't mean, or I don't just mean, the specific problem of children being raped or sodomized by adult men, which of course is the most horrifying aspect of it and the part that most terrifies and appalls people when they read about it and of course is likely to get the most sort of legal attention. I think that's part of a larger system in which we unfortunately do believe that it is legitimate to use children to satisfy our emotional needs. That is a very widespread and deeply rooted problem. And the fact that it is, I think, is one of the reasons that people are slow to see even the worst examples of that kind of abuse. Because any aspect of it is abusive to some extent. In a deeper way, in an emotional way, I think when we do condemn these child abusers, to some extent we're condemning ourselves too. And certainly much about the society that we live in, in which people in positions of authority have certain rights to use people who are not. And the parent-child relationship has been very central in that kind of thinking about power. And I always try to say this, actually, I think I had a line about this in my original draft of the column, but we ultimately dropped it, that child abuse issues are really power issues at bottom. And that's part of the problem. The child is in a position of powerlessness. The person who abuses him is in a position of power. And to really call that what it is, call it by its right name, and to respond to it as morality and the law would seem to require, means shaking up and challenging those power relationships. And at bottom, that's what many of these authorities are so terrified of doing. It's why so many rabbis just can't stomach the idea of people going to the police and not a rabbi with child abuse accusations, thereby implying if the rabbi is not himself a defender of child abusers, which let's hope he's not, he's nevertheless irrelevant to the process by which some little boy is going to call on the carpet somebody, whether he's a teacher, a rabbi, or administrator, whatever he is, in a position of authority in a community that respects that hierarchical privilege. How are you being responded to by the Jewish community? Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. The overwhelming majority of people who do respond to me are always very supportive of what I do. On the other hand, they often say, don't quote me. I don't want my name used. Don't say who I am. Again, we have kind of a split consciousness here. I think that the masses, the overwhelming majority of people in the community, want to see the community living the way our religious ideals suggest it should be lived. Not to mean that we're Pollyannish and don't know about imperfections in life and society, don't know the difficulties we face and so forth, but we really do want to see our religious life as a source of light and joy in the way we live. I think that's a very widely held idea. At the same time, there is, as a function of religious culture, a fear of standing out you know, standing up when everybody's sitting down, of being the one who is or appears to be challenging the power structure of the community. That's something we do with great reluctance. So generally speaking, I'm cheered by the response. At the same time, I'm always a little bit frustrated by the fact that there are limits to how far people are willing to go. And it seems to me from my own perspective that if we're not willing to challenge power, then we're really just speaking words without consequences. We have to be willing to make some practical steps forward to do what we all know needs to be done. Right, and we're part of the problem if we don't. To that extent, yes, and that's a harsh judgment sometimes, and I don't want to make it sound harsh, especially when I'm speaking of people who've been victimized and know that they stand to suffer other kinds of victimization when they do come forward. But I do have to say, yes, that to the extent that we tacitly allow these things to be done without objection, we are helping to feed that system and thereby are becoming a part of it. Where does it stand as far as your involvement in the Mondrowitz case? 
Mondrowitz is irrevocably now a free man in Israel. The extradition request was granted by the Israeli government, but then quashed by the Israeli Supreme Court. So I don't think anything's coming of that on a criminal level. However, four years ago, I filed a freedom of information law request with the Brooklyn District Attorney, as well as the Justice and State Departments of the federal government, to update my information on what's been happening with respect to his extradition or attempts to extradite him since my first request was made, which was back, I think, in 1998. And the District Attorney refused to provide any absolutely anything. I got zero, not one piece of paper. And so I challenged him in court and I won initially. He then appealed and the order was reversed. And I then successfully sought permission to appeal that decision to New York's highest court. That case is pending. We've briefed it fully now. I think the argument is going to be sometime this winter. And I must say I'm very hopeful that the original court ruling in my favor will be restored and I will finally get a chance to look at at least some of the actual record of the efforts to extradite Avram Mondrowitz since 1993. I suspect, given the intense resistance that the office has shown to giving me anything in this cache of documents, that it may show something that we'd like to know. Well, a FOIA requests I know are supposed to be responded to within, I think, 20 days, 20 business days. Yes, well, <laughs> uh, it didn't have, yeah, I don't remember what the rule in New York is, but it's similar to that. Believe me, it wasn't. I didn't get a response for, I think it was a year. I had prodded them a few times, and they told me, oh, we're working on it, but we can't find the file. And then at a certain point, they said, oh, actually, we did find the file. It was in the office of the bureau chief the whole time, a point that I've stressed a couple of times in my legal papers, because I think it's pretty clear that this was all pretext. But first of all, they never intended to grant my request anyway, which is clear from their response. So there was no need to find the file in the first place and they couldn't very well have lost it. It was in the office of their chief. When I finally did get a response, I made an administrative appeal. When that was denied, I went to court, and I'm sure they were hoping I would go away. Yeah. <laughs> but, so it's been four years, and it's going to be more than that by the time we actually get a decision on this from New York's high court. But the court's decision to grant my motion for leave to appeal was itself very unusual. Those are rarely granted, especially when the appellate panel decision against me was unanimous, which it was in this case. Mm-hmm. So I'm very hopeful, especially based on the law, which is very much on my side, that they granted leave because they want to reverse. I certainly hope that's true. Mm. Well, I'm glad you're not giving up, Michael. Well, thank you. It hasn't been easy or cheap to do it. I think it's important. You're very important to the entire truth movement. Well, I hope so. It's a small part to play, but then everybody has to play a small part. That's right, exactly. Absolutely. So Mondrowitz sexually molests hundreds of mostly Orthodox Jewish children. Allegedly, right. since he has never been convicted yet. But the evidence is pointing to that. Oh, yes. Of course, you've interviewed many, many, many people about that. Oh, yes. He's in Israel, and he's living free and easy. And you said earlier that, for political reasons, the Israeli court decided to refuse the U.S. extradition attempt. What do you think the political reasons were? I want to be entirely accurate here because the only commodity I've got to work with here is truth. So I want to be very clear so I'm not accused of being in any way implausible or deviating from the evidence. I don't know exactly what the court's real reasons were, but they couldn't very well have been the reasons stated because the reasons stated in their lengthy but rather largely unintelligible opinion really made no sense. And by the way, this was the second opinion in that case. In Israel, there's a more or less a two-tiered system. It goes from their local district courts, and then you go directly to the Supreme Court on appeal. They don't have a middle layer of appellate courts there. The district court in this case issued a long and, I thought, very well-reasoned decision upholding the extradition order. The Supreme Court reversed it. And what was interesting about the Supreme Court's decision is that it almost never seriously attempted to come to grips with the legal issues that have been argued by the district court, which is always a very interesting sign Mm -hmm. when a court does that. And the reasons they gave really made no sense. For example, the question is presented to the court was, can we extradite somebody to face trial on charges that are as old as these, given the admitted fact that the case is still timely in New York under New York law because he's a fugitive from justice. The basic rule is you have to be tried within a certain amount of time after you're criminally charged. That's a law, and that's based on a constitutional right to a speedy trial. Okay. However, if you go on the lam, the clock doesn't run because in that case, you're the one who caused the delay in time, and that's what happened here. So under New York law, there was no controversy, no question that the case was timely. And Israel itself has similar laws that apply to people who go on the lam from Israel if they are fugitives from justice when charged there. So the question really was, does their doctrine dovetail with our doctrine sufficiently to justify extradition? And again, the court didn't deny that the reason for the delay was that Mondrowitz 
Soviets fled the country and hid in a country from which it was either difficult or for a period of time probably impossible, given the state of the law between the two countries, to extradite him. What the court did say was, get ready because it's going to sound incredible, but what they said was if the United States wanted to change its extradition treaty with Israel in order to make extradition more possible, it should have done it more promptly. I researched this issue. I'm a lawyer. This is what I do. And of course, I'm deeply involved in this case. So I looked as diligently as I can into extradition law. I think this is the first time any court anywhere has advanced such an argument in order to maintain that it would violate the civil rights of the accused to extradite him. I mean, everyone admits he's properly charged. Everyone admits the case is timely in New York. Everyone admits Israel has similar rules that would render a prosecution timely in its country if somebody tried to flee its jurisdiction and got brought back belatedly. But the court said, gosh darn it, why didn't the diplomats work out a new extradition treaty faster so it would have been easier to extradite him? That seems far Yeah, exactly. So I can't tell you what they were really thinking from the point of view of a mind reader, because I'm not a mind reader. But I do know that throughout this case, from the time Mondrowitz fled to Israel until today, there is a very strong body of political support for him, derived largely from his own sect of Hasidim, which is the Ger sect, which is a very influential body of opinion within Israel. In fact, they form really their own political party, and that party has played a very influential role in coalition politics in Israel. So it was a group of people they really didn't want to offend. And of course, they're allied with many other religious parties, but also it's no small thing to offend. Now, during the time this case was pending, Mondrowitz was was incarcerated for about two years. Again, it was possible to say to oneself, if you were so inclined, that we did do something. Yes, we refused to let him stand trial, refused to let the victims come forward and have their day in court, but he did spend some time behind bars. I am willing to believe, though again I can't prove, that it was possible for judges who didn't want to face the political wrath of the religious parties to tell themselves they had really done enough under the circumstances. There was a long time when it sure looked like he would never pay any price whatsoever. And by the way, let me be clear, I do not think this is an acceptable substitute for an actual criminal trial. But I think they could have looked at it as if it were. And I think that was very likely the political edge that drove the case where it went. I certainly can't come up with any other good reason. Right. Yeah, that's pretty amazing that they use that reasoning. <laughs> yeah, and during oral argument of the case, the questions that the judges asked were really not aimed at the law. The judge who ultimately wrote the opinion, Ayala Pukakia, said things like, I never heard of a case like this. I never heard of a case where we were asked to extradite somebody for crimes that happened 20 years ago. I don't think anyone ever been asked for an extradition for crimes that committed that many years back, but there had been other extradition cases. The issue was not altogether new, and the district court had discussed that, but it was just as if the justices really did not want to engage the legal issue and sort of wanted to distress the unusual, the odd aspects of the case as sort of a way of dismissing it or marginalizing it. Again, I can't say for sure that's what they were doing, but it looks to me that way. Right. The evidence points to the facts that they went on the side of political expediency versus doing, I guess, what's right, especially in light of how you said one of Mondrowitz's victims had killed himself? At least one. I've been told at least two have, to be honest. I actually interviewed the mother of the victim, so in this case I know specifically about it. According to her, both this child and, if I'm not mistaken, one of his brothers had also been abused uh, by Mondrowitz. This one, they killed himself. Do you think that, and of course you've spoken to many victims about their experiences, do you think that there might be one or two victims who might want to take justice into their own hands and make a visit to Israel and find Mondrowitz, which probably shouldn't be that difficult. I mean, Israel isn't that No, actually it's not difficult at all. He's never hidden his whereabouts. Right. I certainly don't want anybody to do that. It's interesting you ask the question because one of the articles in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz that featured this case, in which I obviously figured as a source as well and was quoted, began the story of a fellow, and I know him, I know who he is, I know him quite well, who said that he had set out with the intention of killing Avram Mondrowitz, the man he says abused him many years ago when he was a child, but it didn't happen ultimately because his wife intuited what he was thinking of doing and got in the way of his travel plans and made it impossible. Now, of course, in theory, he could have gone another time, but he says, no, once I thought about it, I realized I didn't really want to do that because I'm paraphrasing him, but essentially it would have just added to his abuse if he had had to end up in prison for having done that, and he didn't want to give that additional fill-up to the history of abuse he'd already suffered. But you're right. I mean, in theory, it could happen. What is more interesting to me and more disappointing was that even when we knew the case was before the Supreme Court, even when we knew the day that the decision was expected to be announced, I could not, working with all the abuse advocates advocates I could find, I could not get anybody to go to that court and even just stand outside in a demonstration just to demonstrate we care about this result. We want to see justice done. That to me is the more important fact because that's something people can do, 
should do. There's no reason not to, but it's something that even people very much involved in these issues, people who have been victimized and people who know those who have been victimized, are really slow to do mm. because it means exposing themselves, having themselves stand out and named as somebody who is taking a position on this issue. And then people inevitably will ask, well, why are you doing this? Are you a victim? Does that mean we should look at you as... Damaged right. sexually, right. and or, your children or, perhaps as well, right. and so on and so forth. So without generalizing too much, because it can't really be fair, I do know the fact is we couldn't get anybody. That's still something of a bone that sticks in my throat. I couldn't. I live here in New Jersey, and I couldn't get over to Israel for that day and do such a thing. But there are plenty of people in Israel who've been victimized in various ways, and it was a shame that we couldn't get somebody to go out and make a public issue of this case. Right. Public interest is very much a factor, too. Right. It's that stigma, I guess. Well, that's right. And people like Mondrowitz exploit that fact. And it's one of the things that I think we need to change. Mm. So where do we go from here? You got the article in, it attracted a lot of attention. You got a couple of responses, letters to the editor, which were very positive. What's the next step? Well, it's always hard to know, but I'm always working on these issues. I will be arguing the Freedom of Information Law case this winter. I'm working on other cases, not at the moment within the Orthodox Jewish community, but I have plenty of cases related to child abuse issues within the United States. That's not going to stop, just as the problems aren't going to stop. And the problems that I deal with are not so different in whatever community I'm working within. I'm not just taking a case as a rule because a child was allegedly abused. I'm usually involved in the case because somebody got punished for raising that issue. In most of my cases, for example, it's a mother who alleged that her child was being sexually abused by the father, and they've lost custody for making that allegation, or they, in one case, the mother's parental rights were actually terminated. And I'm trying to get something done about that. So we're still facing a considerable culture of denial on many levels, and I'm doing what I can to work on it as a writer and as a lawyer. Yeah, it's not an easy job, Michael. I couldn't see myself doing that. You must hear all these stories and see all the things that happen. You have to be commended for doing what you do. Well, thank you. I hope so, though I don't know that I do as much for these people as I wish I could. But I do think it's important that the issues get raised. A couple of years ago, I briefed and argued a case before the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals on behalf of a girl who was brutally raped by her father. She ultimately got a civil verdict against him, a million-dollar verdict. But we were also in court because the criminal case against him had been dropped by the prosecutors on extremely flimsy pretext. And we alleged, with considerable evidence, that it was really dropped because it was an incest case. And that had the perpetrator of the same act been a stranger, they would have pursued it. So we filed suit against the prosecutors under an equal protection theory. And we lost. Arguing that case, I think I knew when the argument was over that we were going to lose from the kinds of questions the judges asked me. But I'm still glad that I did it. One day, because I really think our arguments were airtight, Somebody will revisit that case and revisit my briefs and revisit the oral argument and will say, yes, this makes sense. We should do this. And when that happens, a whole class of people who, according to this court decision, have no legal rights to have their perpetrators prosecuted will be vindicated. It hasn't happened yet, but I believe it will happen one day. And when it does, it will be something that I can take some pride in, though the immediate experience was one of frustration and defeat. Right. Now, you practice law in New Jersey and what other states? Well, I'm admitted in New York. I don't like to do courtroom work. On the other hand, I do like to work with cases all over the country. So what I'm generally doing is sort of a second chair role where I'm drafting written work. If it's an appeal, I often do actually appear in the appeals and make the oral arguments, but I don't do trial work as a rule. So that, for example, this was a case that arose in Arkansas that I was telling you about a moment ago, and then I argued it in the Eighth Circuit, which was down in St. Louis. I'll work with cases anywhere in the United States, but I'm not the guy that goes in and calls the witnesses and questions them. I'm the fellow that writes the appeals, the motions, and so forth. And that's usually where I come in. That's mm. usually where things stand. We're either appealing a decision that we think was bad. In other cases, I'm acting as a consultant. They are at the trial level, but I'm in there telling them what I think they ought to do or not do and helping to supervise the conduct of the case and contributing. And sometimes I even contribute to trial work. I'll draft all the questions for examinations and cross-examinations and so on. It's a multifaceted practice. And again, I always characterize myself as a writer, first and foremost. I work on fiction, poetry, nonfiction. But this is work I'm doing too, and I will be doing it for a while to come. My website is michaellesher.com, and my email is right there on the website, so it's easy to get me. I'll give my email address now anyway. It's Michael Lesher, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-L-E-S-H-E-R, all one word, at optonline.net, O-P-T-O-N-L-I-N-E.net. As I said, all you have to remember is my name, because if you look up michaellesher.com, you'll get the contact information there. And I'm pretty much always reachable by email, except on Jewish holidays and the Sabbath. Michael, thank you again for the time you took out explaining all this to the listeners. Well, thank you.